The Warren Commission, I think, either was unable to learn the truth and to complete the investigation, or they decided to conceal some of the truth based on what they saw as the vital interest of the nation. Whatever has been written more recently about John F. Kennedy, about his personal life and some personal weaknesses, I hold that he was a great president. He had great plans for the future, for the future of the United States and the world, that had great promise for the entire world. The world could have turned out quite differently if those plans were realized. And my question is, was this really to the liking of some people both in your country and perhaps in our country and elsewhere? That's my question. For many years she remained unidentified and because of her distinctive headscarf was known simply as the Babushka Lady. I had President Kennedy right in my Zoom lens. You know, I could see Connolly anytime. He's a Texan, right? Appreciate him, love him, he's great. But I wanted to see the president. When I first uh, heard a noise, I was not aware that that was a shot being fired. And maybe perhaps that's why I continued to film, because I thought it was a backfire or a, a firecracker. I mean, I wasn't used to being around guns. I, I did not realize that those were shots until I saw in my fr the frame of my camera President Kennedy's head come off the back of his head. Then I realized that that was a shot. Uh, I don't know how many I heard. I know sp where I thought the shots came from I, was uh, the picket fence area in that, around that large tree somewhere on the other side of those steps, but in the picket fence area. There was a figure there and there was smoke there. I will always believe that the man that shot President Kennedy was standing somewhere in the picket fence area. And no one will ever convince me any differently standing right at the east end of the triple underpass on the sidewalk between the main and commerce and when the first shot which i thought was a firecracker happened and i heard two more i ducked behind the triple underpass and actually did not see too much of what was going on until i looked out and the presidential limousine was going right by me under the underpass at that time deputy sheriff buddy walters said you have blood on your cheek I reached up, and there was a couple drops of blood. And at that time, I remembered something had stung me during the shooting. He says, where were you standing? We walked back, and from about 40 feet away, we noticed a mark on the curb, a very fresh mark. The FBI sends some agents from Dallas, and they file a report that says there's no mark there. It must have been eradicated by the brushes using to sweep the streets. You know, there'd be no streets left in the world if that happened, but it was accepted. But this wasn't even in the street, it was on the curbstone. So, of course, they couldn't get away with that. So the commission got after the FBI and they sent Lindall Shaney felt a photographic expert down. And accompanied by Robert Gemberling, who was the case agent in Dallas on the assassination, they went, they got the pictures, they spoke to the photographers, they went exactly to where a point was, and there it was. Except that it was a little bit different. Instead of a hole, you can see the difference in color, you can see the difference in texture. And I know because I've examined it at the archives, it's darker and smoother. Instead of a bullet hole or a nick made by a bullet, you've got it all smoothed over in darker color. So they, they dig it up, they take it back to Washington, they go through this incredible charade of making a spectro of scraping samples off and making a spectrographic analysis of what they know is not the evidence. They don't give a damn about the fact that underneath it is something that could have been a consequence that hadn't been covered over. They have no questions about why would somebody want to hide this when a president is killed. And uh, then they destroyed the spectrographic plate when I asked for it. At least they say they did. And the court said they produce it. They said it doesn't exist. And the explanation? Not under oath, understand. Just a possible explanation. It must have done it to save space. A 32nd of an inch in the, in the world's largest collection of files, which the FBI has, they're saving space with 1 32nd of an inch. But they get away with this in court. With evidence assured, I can now prove without any doubt that there was at least five shots fired that day. The first shot, let's say, would be the 45 bullet found by the sewer cover, which was confirmed to witnesses by Dallas police as being a bullet before intelligence got in the way and said it was a skull fragment. The second shot, as just discussed, by an unknown weapon, which struck the curb. That's two missed shots accounted for. The third shot, as the Warren Commission claims, would be the so-called magic bullet. 
the government claims that the bullet passed through Kennedy's back, exiting out the front and hitting Connolly in several locations. No bullet in history has ever done so much damage, so that theory is impossible, and by today's standards, even laughable. As this autopsy photograph reveals, the shot that they claim entered Kennedy's back is actually a posterior exit wound, indicating that the shot had to have come from the front. There are no photographs released of Kennedy's stomach or chest area in full detail, so it's hard to prove that the bullet had an entrance. However, they are claiming that the wound to Kennedy's neck is actually that exit wound. But as proven previously, the wound in the neck was actually indeed an entrance wound, which was tampered with during the autopsy. Here, in the Sapruder film, you can clearly see that Kennedy has already been shot through the throat, choking as the motorcade glides down the sniper zone. In this famous photograph, notice a hole in the windshield of the limousine, indicating that a shot has already been fired from the front. This has rarely been discussed and is a vital aspect to finding out what truly happened and resolve at last a 50-year-old conspiracy. It will no longer be called a conspiracy theory, but fact, once all the pieces of the puzzle are put in place. We live in a novel situation. We live in a country of over 200... 230 million people, where now for more than 20 years the official government position with regard to the assassination of one of the finest presidents we ever had, the official government position, continues to be that it was done by a lone assassin. This is now nearly a decade after the House Subcommittee on Assassinations concluded that it was a conspiracy. Nevertheless, the official position remains that it was done by Lone Sasson. The position which initially was concluded and announced by the Warren Commission so, of so many years past, the infamous Warren Commission. And I say infamous because most people, most thinking people in the United States recognize that without any question, there had to be more than one gun shooting. It's obvious. And it was obvious to everyone at Dealey Plaza on November 22nd. 1963. Behind the picket fence, there is a car park, and in 1963, Gordon Arnold was a 22-year-old serviceman, just out of training camp and en route to a posting in Alaska. This is his first film interview. On that particular morning, what happened was I came downtown and I thought there was going to be a parade. So what I did was I parked my vehicle back here in this parking lot, and I intentionally walked to this particular corner because I wanted to take a pictures of the parade off of the railroad bridge. Well, this is about as far as I got, because what happened is when I got my leg to about this position, a man came around the corner off the bridge, had a suit on, and he turned around and he told me that I wasn't going to be there. And I guess I was younger and more spunky at that time, because I told him, you and who else is going to keep me off the bridge? And he pulled out identification card and he said I'm with the CIA and I said well that's enough muscle I'll leave so I turned around and I brought my leg back over like this and I walked down the fence line here about halfway and I was looking over the fence to see if I could get a good shot of the parade and he come back up and he told me he says I told you to get out of this area and I said okay so I walked the complete length of the fence got around on the other side that's when I started to line up my frame so that I could take the picture of the parade. I had been panning shots through here so that I could get whatever was going to come down the street. And I saw that it was the President of the United States. And as I was panning down this direction, just as I got to about this position, a shot came right past my left ear. And that meant it would have had to have come from this direction. And that's when I fell down. and. To me, it seemed like a second shot was at least fired over my head. It was, there was a bunch of report going on in, the, in this particular area at that time. And what happened was that while I was laying on the ground, it seemed like a gentleman came from this particular direction. And I thought it was a police officer because he had a uniform of a police officer. But he didn't wear a hat. And he had dirty hands. But it didn't really matter much at that time because with him crying like he was and with him shaking when he had the weapon in his hand, I think I'd have gave him almost anything except the camera because that was my mother's. 
and literally what the man did was kick kick me and asked me if I was taking a picture. I told him that I was. And when I looked at the weapon, it was about that big around, and I decided I'd let him go ahead and have the film. I gave it to him, and then he went back off in this direction. I went off in this direction. And three days later, I was in Alaska. And I didn't come back to the United States for about 18 months. If you just keep in mind who profited most from the assassination, and then ask yourself some questions. Who appointed the members of the Warren Commission? And who runs the CIA, which has concealed a tremendous amount of evidence? And who runs the FBI? The Central Intelligence Agency, FBI, under the direction of J. Edgar Hoover, with assistance from the government under the newly sworn in president, Texan Lyndon B. Johnson, continued to allow its interrogators to discredit the fact that there had been shots fired from the grassy knoll area. It was becoming more and more obvious that Oswald was indeed the patsy being set up and executed so that the truth would be buried forever. Hundreds of people are now dead and continue to die for exposing the truth about the events that really transpired on that November day in Dallas. Anyone who would speak any truth about facts pertaining to the actual events were either discredited and ignored by the media on orders of the shadow government or murdered themselves in very curious circumstances. And one of the important and yet often neglected witnesses in the Kennedy case is a railroad signalman named Lee Bowers, who was working in a railroad tower behind the picket fence and behind the grassy knoll. And he had a good view of the area uh, where we see these figures. And he testified to the Warren Commission and told them that uh, when Kennedy appeared in Dealey Plaza, there were two men behind the fence that he could see. And these two men were uh, in this one position the whole time before, during, and after the shooting. Lee Bowers died in a mysterious car accident two and a half years after the assassination. However, his story is confirmed by another eyewitness, Ed Hoffman, a deaf mute who is interviewed here for the first time. I'd gotten off work early because I had a dentist's appointment. I was traveling down the freeway here and I remembered that President Kennedy was coming to visit Dallas. I parked my car here. I realized at this spot that I would be able to see Kennedy pass close by. I stood here and waited and I was looking towards where he would be coming from. I suddenly saw two men who looked suspicious directly over there in the car park. 25 years ago, these trees did not obscure the view. From his position at the side of the freeway, Ed Hoffman could clearly see the car park area behind the grassy knoll. I saw a man standing here, wearing a black hat and a blue jacket. I saw a puff of smoke and I thought it was a cigarette, but it wasn't. He had a gun and he walked towards the railroad. He tossed the gun to the second man. Then he turned and straightened his jacket, adjusted his hat, and walked casually away. The man with the striped shirt, the railroad shirt, walked over to the electrical box with the gun. He took the gun apart. He put it in a toolbox. He then walked slowly away in the direction of the railroad track. When the motorcade passed by below me here, I realized that Kennedy had been shot. I was horrified. I saw a policeman standing on the railroad bridge and I tried to get his attention, but he didn't see me. So I got in my car and drove to the area where I had seen the two men. But there were so many people there, and I couldn't find them. I went to the FBI to tell them what I had seen. They didn't want me to say anything. They offered me money to keep quiet. They didn't understand that it was more important for me to tell them what I had seen. I do feel that the two men I saw were working together, and that the one with the gun behind the fence was the man who shot President Kennedy. Комиссия Уоррен. 
the Warren Commission, I think, either was unable to learn the truth and to complete the investigation or they decided to conceal some of the truth based on what they saw as the vital interest of the nation. Fire or a firecracker, I mean, I wasn't used to being around guns. I, I did not realize that those were shots until I saw in my fr the frame of my camera President Kennedy's head come off, the back of his head. Then I realized that that was a shot. Uh, I don't know how many I heard. I know sp where I thought the shots came from. Whatever has been written more recently about John F. Kennedy, about his personal life and some personal weaknesses, I hold that he was a great president. He had great plans for the future, for the future of the United States and the world, that had great promise for the entire world. Simply as the babushka lady. I had President Kennedy right in my Zoom lens. You know, I could see Conley anytime. He's a Texan, right? Appreciate him, love him, he's great. But I wanted to see the president. When I first uh, heard a noise, I was not aware that that was a shot being fired. And maybe perhaps that's why I continued to film, because I thought it was a back... The world could have turned out quite differently if those plans were realized. And my question is, was this really to the liking of some people both in your country and perhaps in our country and elsewhere? That's my question. For many years she remained unidentified and because of her distinctive headscarf was known